You're listening to Nightlight. Hello and welcome to Nightlight. So nice to be back with you again. On this show, I'm excited to introduce to you David Kiran. David describes himself as a passionate Bible reader who loves to discover new things about God's Word. He's an avid student of history, anthropology, language, and context in order to get the most out of his studies. And David is with us on Nightlight today. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. David, when you told me that your topic for today was about David and Goliath, I immediately wondered what more there is to say about one of the most famous stories in the Bible. But I know that you will have some fresh insights that we've never heard before. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's an, it's a very interesting story. It's one of those stories that have kind of gone, you know, from from the pages of the Bible into myth and legend. It's something that is used so frequently around the world like even in secular circles non-christian circles they still refer to the story of david and goliath almost as a metaphor of someone who is like a real underdog standing up against something that is so much bigger and greater than them so yes it's true it's it's such a well-known story it's difficult to get anything new out of it at least that's what i thought but interestingly enough through last year and trying to look at the things with new eyes and kind of reading into it and reflecting on the history of it, I would have to say that I got some pretty interesting, interesting things out of it. And so I hope that in the time together, we can share some things that might provide a bit of a new perspective on the entire thing and hopefully help us get some new stuff out of it. Nightlight Insights. Okay, so let's, if you can turn to uh, Book of Samuel, First Samuel chapter 17, and just read verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekar in Ephesdemim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Okay, so this is a classic illustration of ancient warfare. In the olden days, war was usually fought between two armies on foot. Uh, Mounted warfare wasn't really something that came into play until quite a few years later. And so these guys are mostly um, done by foot soldiers. And so whoever had the higher ground won. And this was kind of played out all the way until, you know, for example, they invented things like airplanes. Right. But until then, whoever had the higher ground had the advantage in the battle. And so we have here, Mm. the Philistines are camped up on one mountain. The Israelites are camped up on the other mountain. And there's a big valley in between them. And now they have to determine who is going to cave in first. Because in order to attack the other person, you kind of have to get down off your mountain into the valley and then climb up the next side of the mountain. Right. Which puts you at a disadvantage because you are then going uphill and the higher ground is held by your enemy. So this is what is currently known as a stalemate. And this is has been played out through pretty much most of ancient warfare all the way up till, I believe, the Second World War. Yes. Because even the First World War was fought in a similar fashion. Both sides would dig into the trenches and then they would just sit there and not do much because if you had to get up and attack the other person's trench, then that means you were conceding the ground to them and you were out in the open, you were exposed and they could attack you much more easily. It wasn't until the Germans invented Blitzkrieg, which was a strategy of using tanks and airplanes that completely neutralized the objective of stalemate warfare and so that was what completely changed up warfare in our modern century but all the way from from world war one prior to the time of david and goliath this is around a thousand bc at this time they were still practicing this type of warfare where both people would claim the high ground and then they'd wait for each other to make a move and so one of the ways of making a move was you could send out your entire army, or you could send out one particular person to make a challenge, which is what happens in this story. So if you can go to verse 4. 
And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. All right, so there's this big dude who comes out, and this guy's huge. He's very tall, very powerful, very strong, and he's a massively imposing figure. Now, according to uh, this account from the Bible, he is six cubits in a span that's roughly about nine and a half feet tall, which makes it even more imposing when you consider that the average height of people in the ancient world at this time was about five feet tall. Really? So this guy is literally twice the size of the average human. He's huge. He not only is so large and so big and so powerful, he also carries the most impressive weaponry. I mean, we're not going to get a chance to go through it, but you read the next couple of verses and it talks about his weaponry that he has. First of all, he's got armor made of brass. Now, armor made of brass was extremely rare. This was the time when most people had things made out of iron. Brass, as we know, is, is very shiny. It also catches the sun very well, and it tends to distort images as well. And so when you look at your face on brass, for example, it completely blows it up out of proportion. It kind of does very, very weird things with your eyesight. So not only was this guy huge and imposing, the armor that he wore made him kind of like shine in the sun and completely distorted his features out of proportion. This guy was menacing. Gosh. And then it talks about the stuff that he carried and his big spear and his spear was like, you know, the staff was like a weaver's beam and it had a, the head of the spear weighed so many kilograms. And this guy's like this huge, huge imposing target. So much so that his, he had to have a person walking in front of him carrying his shield because he can't hold on to it himself. I mean, you have to imagine the terror of the people of Israel looking down and seeing this absolutely ginormous monstrosity right who you know glows in the sun and has every single inch of him covered up in armor just walking down to them and challenging them to a fight and so what happens verse 8 and he stood and cried unto the armies of israel and said unto them why are ye come out to set your battle in array am i not a philistine and ye servants to saul choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Mm -hmm. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. All right. So, so he what he's doing is is very common in the ancient in the ancient world and days of warfare. If you've seen the movie Troy, which Brad Pitt stars in, which came out in about 2004, they do the exact same thing. They'll go down to a place, they'll bring both their armies together and they say, "Well, we don't want to kill each other off because as you know, we kind of like ourselves staying alive. So you send us a champion, I'll give you my champion, both of them can fight and then whoever wins, then we hand the army over." And so this was a very common strategy used in ancient warfare. And so we have Goliath over here throwing out his challenge saying, why should we all die? Doesn't make much sense. So what we'll do is I will fight and then you send me someone to fight and then the loser will surrender and the winner will be victorious. And if I lose, then we will serve you. But if you lose, then you will be our servants. Right. And so obviously, as it says in verse... 10 that when the Philist sorry verse 11 it says when Saul and all of Israel heard these words they were dismayed and greatly afraid because who can stand up to the challenge of this particular person this is just way beyond anything that they can possibly conceive here is a challenge that they have had no idea of how to tackle and this in their way is this massive monster of an obstacle who is telling them that if you want any hope of victory, you got to get through me first. And that's a very daunting prospect. Now we're introduced to a new character in the story in verse 12. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. 
And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. All right, this is a pretty cool thing about this story. Okay, so then we're introduced to David, and we've been introduced to David before. David appeared in chapter 16. So in chapter 16, we hear about David, and David's the youngest son of Jesse, and he's got, he's got seven older brothers, and they're all big, and they're all strong, and then God sends Samuel, the prophet, to anoint a new king because his spirit is left from Saul. And so he comes, and he tells him to go to the house of Jesse. He goes to the house of Jesse. He finds all the sons of Jesse, he looks at them and he says, ooh, look, this guy could be king, or this guy could be king, or this guy could be king. And basically what God tells him is that, no, none of these guys are going to be king. I want to anoint the youngest. And so David's father, Jesse, doesn't even consider David as a worthy candidate. He's got him off feeding the sheep. And then Samuel says, no, I want to see him. We're not going to eat until he comes. And so David comes back from taking care of the sheep, and then Samuel sees him, and God tells him that you're supposed to anoint him because this guy's going to be the next king. By the way, David's probably about 17 years old at this time. He's a pretty young chap. Right. And so after he gets anointed and he, God tells him that he's going to be the next king, you have to imagine that he's pretty excited about that because, okay, this is something very different than what I envisioned for my life, right? Yes. Right now, currently, his only ambition is just to you know be one of the shepherds because that is the only thing that's a, that is realistic for him being the youngest son of a large family right and so what happens is that through a series of interesting events he ends up being summoned into Saul's court to work as a musician because what's happening is is that Saul is being troubled by an evil spirit and music is the only thing that calms him down, the only thing that placates him. And so since David is quite skilled on the harp, he gets called in to play music for Saul so that way Saul can at least calm down and not have so many issues. And so you might be thinking that, okay, now Samuel said I was going to be king, and now I have the opportunity to be in the court of the king. So, hey, that's pretty cool. Look what a wonderful opportunity I have. Right. You know, I can see this thing's coming together. I can see that God is working out his will. I can see that things are kind of happening. So, okay, maybe this is my pat to the throne. So he's around the king, and he's playing music and all that stuff. And then it says here in verse 15 that David has been sent away from Saul because of the battle. So now David gets sent home because Saul goes off to war and obviously he doesn't think war is a place for a young guy. And so he says, okay, send this guy home and send me his older brothers to go to battle. So you have to be wondering what is going on through David's head here at this point. It doesn't take a great stretch of imagination to figure that David's probably bummed out. It's true. He's like, oh, come on. You know, God said that I was going to do something. He said I was going to be the next king. I was so close to the king, and now I've got sent home, and I'm once again looking after dumb sheep. Right. David, for all intents and purposes, as you can imagine, is probably pretty grumpy about that. But as we know, God's got opportunities for everyone, and God has a plan for everybody, and even, you know, the greatest setbacks can always turn out for our advantages. And so even though David's at home, Away from the battlefield, God still got a way of using him, and that is where we hear about him next in the story. So, verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. So what's happening is, so after, after a little while, they, they're feeling a little bit concerned because they haven't heard anything from everyone. So, they, so then David's dad gets a little bit worried about what's happening with his boys. And so he says, okay, go take some food for them. You know, bring them some home cooking because, as we know, home cooking is best. And so go bring them food so they can be fine. And then at the same time, go to the captain and get some news from him. And so take this food for the captain as a bit of a kind of like a bribery to let give him some news. Then find out what's exactly happening with the battle because we have no news and we're a little bit concerned. 
And so David says, okay, I'm going to go off and do that. So verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Okay, so let me just uh, explain what's happening here. This is pretty interesting. So then David arrives there, and he arrives early in the morning. And as soon as he arrives early in the morning, he sees the soldiers getting ready for battle. And this was something that seemed to happen every morning. They would get ready for battle, and they would all shout and get ready and get themselves all pumped up. And then David's like, oh, this is exciting. So David runs over there to, with the men to see them. And then as they go over the crest of the hill, sure enough, there's Goliath. And Goliath shouts at everybody and throws out his challenge. And all of them retreat, kind of afraid. And so David says, hey, what's going on here? And then his, the guys kind of tell him, and they say, Are you, how, can you see this guy? You know, he's the one who's coming up to defy Israel. And have you seen all the things that he is doing and all the things that he is saying? And something super interesting is mentioned over here. Here is what, what these guys are saying. They say that this is what Saul has said. It says the king will enrich him with great riches. He will give him his daughter to marry, and he will make his house free in Israel. Right. So you can almost picture the comedy of this scene happening. Saul's afraid to fight, but Saul wants someone to go out and fight for him. This has been happening for 40 days now. 40 days, wow. And every time, Saul's rewards are getting bigger. So just picture the scene in your head, because this is pretty comical. So everyone gets up in the morning, and Saul calls out to everyone. He's like, okay, everyone, we're going to go for battle. Everyone, get ready. And everyone's like, yes. And then Saul gets up on his horse, you know, kind of like a scene from Braveheart, and he shouts at everybody. He's like, all right, so whoever goes today and fights with the Philistines, I will give them 10 pieces of gold. And everyone shouts, yay, we want 10 pieces of gold. And so they all shout, and they all pump themselves up. They come over the crest of the hill. Goliath shouts at them, and they all run away. They're like, nope, not doing it today. Gosh. Okay, well, that was a failure. Next morning, Saul gets up on his horse. Everyone gets ready. They're like, okay, whoever goes and attacks the Philistines today, we're going to give them 20 pieces of gold. Everyone's like, yay, we want 20 pieces of gold. And they all rush out, and sure enough, they see Goliath. Goliath shouts at them, and they all come back and like, nope, we're not doing this. And the scene continues on for a period of days and then finally Saul gets up one morning and he's like okay whoever goes out they're never going to have to pay taxes for the rest of their life and everyone's like yay we don't like taxes everyone get up let's go they all get over the crest Goliath shouts at them they go back home and they're like okay that didn't work next morning Saul's like okay whoever goes out not only will I give them money not only will they never have to pay taxes but they're Parents will never have to pay taxes. In fact, their entire family lineage will never have to pay taxes to the crown. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Right. So like, okay, let's go. They all get up, climb over the crest. Goliath shouts at them. They all go back running. Gosh. And finally, this goes on for days and days and days. And now Saul's like, all right, here's what's going to happen. Okay. Not only am I going to give you money, not only you're not going to pay taxes, not only is your family going to be free for taxes for as long as they live, but I will give you my daughter to marry. So you will be next in line to the throne. As soon as I die, you will be king. And everyone's like, yes, that sounds good. We want that. And so they get up, they come over the crest of the hill. Goliath shouts at them and they run away. Nothing that Saul can promise them can make it worth enough for them to go face their fears and fight the giant. And so this is what they tell David. Now, what's David's response? Verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? 
For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> so listen to what David says. What David says is so interesting. David says, are you kidding me? Who is this Philistine that he has defied the armies of the living God? And why are you waiting to get something in order to go and deal with him? He says, why are you waiting for a reward when you should be doing it out of your own conscience sake? Because it's the right thing to do. Here is a man who is defying God. And as servants of the living God, you are supposed to get involved with that. Yes. And so what the Israelites were saying was no, no amount of reward that the king can give us makes it worth us giving our lives. And David says, how can you not give your life for what you know is right? That's right. He completely flips the question on its head. It's no longer, okay, what can you give me to make me do what's right? What can I get out of it in order to do the right thing? And David says, absolutely not. You need to do the right thing because it is right, regardless of what you can get out of it. Not because of your reward, but because it is right. He says, you're looking at it the wrong way. You're looking at it, what is going to make it worth it for me to do this? And David says, that's the absolutely wrong way of looking at it. You should be doing it because it is right. And because you are a servant of God, you need to go out and fulfill his will. Yes. Paul talks about this as well in the book of Romans. Paul talks about, you know, when, he's, when he speaks about giving your life as a living sacrifice, when he talks about uh, living in love and service for everybody else, he says, you can't look at it as, okay, what's in it for me? What am I getting out of it? If I love this person, what am I going to get out of it? If I help this person, what is the benefit for me? You know, if I, if I do good to this person, then what, what, what am I going to get from it? And Paul says that's the absolutely wrong way of looking at it. You have to look at what has Christ done for me? What has his sacrifice brought about in my life? Amen. By the death and resurrection of Jesus and by the infilling of his Holy Spirit, what has changed in my life? And then in that case, if I look at that, the only reasonable thing that I can do is to love other people is to serve other people, is to stand up for the truth, not because of what I can get out of it, but because of what God has already done for me, that now I have no other thing to do but do the right thing. And that's why if you see the NIV translation of the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says that as if you present your body as a living sacrifice, this is the only true and acceptable form of of worship. When you see everything that God has done for you, the only acceptable response to that is to give everything. And this is what David's saying over here. He says, why are you trying to see what you can get out of it? You should be doing it just because it is right. It is the right thing to do, and that is what should give you courage. Amen. You can't tell me that, okay, I'm going to wait till the king gives me the biggest reward possible, and then maybe I'll consider doing it. I will wait till people treat me well, and then maybe I'll consider treating them well. You know, I will wait till people show favor to me, and then I will show favor to them. What did Jesus say about that in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, if you only love people who love you, he says, what, what good is that? He says, even the pagan people do that. I tell you to love your enemies. I tell you to do good to those who hate you and those who despitefully use you. Right. That is what you need to do. Not because of what you're going to get out of it, but because it is what God has asked you to do. And this is what David tells them. He says, guys, you got this all wrong. Stop waiting for your reward and do it because you know it is right. It's kind of interesting, their response in verse 27. What does verse 27 say? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. <laughs> so the people are like, no, 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 no. But, but the rewards, right? The rewards. This is what's supposed to happen. They're still focused on it. They're missing the point entirely. David is over there trying to tell them the truth of the matter, and they're un unable to come to grips with the fact that they still want to get their benefit out of it. So much so that his, his own siblings start getting angry at him because they're getting convicted by what he's saying. Have you ever observed yourself? When someone tells you something that is right, 
but you don't really respect the person, you always come up with an excuse or an accusation. This is what David's older brother does. You can see in verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former matter. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. Okay, so then Eliab gets super upset at him. And he's like, oh, don't give us all this big talk about all that you want to do and saying that this is right and all this stuff. You're basically just coming here because you're naughty and because you're bored and because you want to get away from the sheep and you just want to show off. So don't give us all your attitude. Don't give us all your high and mighty things. You know, you're just basically trying to do this to cover up. They're basically just just trying to justify their own conscience by turning it on David and saying, yeah, well, you're just trying to appear self-righteous and you're just trying to appear like you know better than everyone else. And you're you're just saying it because you want to get away with something else. And therefore, you're trying to make us look bad. And David says, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm actually want to get involved with this. And so it says that David's going from man to man, actually telling them this thing. So you can imagine the stir that is coming in the camp because David's walking through the camp, telling everyone that they should go and fight for the sake of God. And the camp's in a bit of an uproar because David's saying to go. And I was like, no, we can't go. And David's like, you should go. And it's a bit of an uproar. So finally, uh, Saul's like, what's this commotion out in the camp? And they come to Saul and they're like, well, there's this little crazy boy outside going around and telling everyone that they should go to battle because that's what they're supposed to do. That's what God would have them do because they're supposed to stand up for their beliefs and everything. And Saul's like, okay, this is weird. Send the fellow over. And so the guy, they go bring him in to see Saul. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. <laughs> so then David comes into Saul and he's like, all right, you know what? I have no faith in your guys. I have no faith in these people. I've talked to them. I've told them to come. None of them want to do. You know, you don't, you don't need to send any of them. You don't even have to go yourself. I'm going to go do it. Okay, I don't care who comes. I try to talk to everybody. No one wants to go with me. That doesn't matter. I'm going to be the only one to go. You know, what's that famous song we used to sing? Though none go with me, still I will follow. And this is David yeah. saying, I don't care who comes with me. I've talked to everyone. I've tried to reason with them. No one wants to reason with. I don't care. I'm going to go. That's a very interesting outlook to have on life because most of us are always trying to look for everyone else to do things. That's right. You know, we want to look at other people and say, okay, so you're going to do something. And then if you do it, then I'll follow along. We always want to be for other people to blaze the trail and then we can go along with them. But a lot of times when it comes to doing the right thing, there's not many people who are doing it. There's not many people pushing in that direction. That's right. What is that famous verse that says, you know, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, but broad is the way and wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction. And there's always going to be way more people doing the wrong thing than people who are doing the right thing because it's so much easier to take the path of least resistance and go about doing the way that's not correct. But on the other side, the right thing to do is going to run you straight into an obstacle. The right way to go is headlong into this gigantic giant. Yes. And no one else wants to walk that path. But David's like, I don't care if anyone else wants to walk it. I need to do it. And I am going to do it. And I am going to do it because I know this is right. Praise God. That's why we hear of David after all these years. That's why we have this story. Because one man decided that I'm going to do this because it is right. I don't care who is with me. I don't care how many people stand against me. I don't care what the odds are. I am going to face it down with God's grace. And that is what changes the world. When a person or a group of people decide that nothing is going to stand in their way, no one's going to hold them back. They are going to face it down with God's grace. 
And that's what David decides to do. And just to uh, uh, shorten it down, because we're coming down to uh, my favorite part of it. So David has a conversation with Saul and Saul's like, you can't go. You're just a young boy. You know, he's been a man of war since his youth. And David says, no, I've had experience. I've killed a lion and a bear. And God kept me through that. And he will keep me through this as well. And then Saul's like, okay, fine. I'll let you go. But you really need to do something first. So here's what he does. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Okay, so very, very interesting point. And I think for me, this is one of the most amazing things from this story. Saul says, all right, fine, I can't deny your faith. I can't deny all these things. Let me, let me at least equip you to go out, okay? And so he gives him his armor and he puts his armor on him and he gives him his sword and all those different things. And you have to realize that this is very, very, very uncomfortable for David because this doesn't fit him at all. First of all, Saul's a big guy. In other places back in Samuel, it talks about Saul standing head and shoulders above his brethren. And so Saul would have been at least six feet tall, if not more. He's a pretty big dude. And armor in those days was made to fit, especially a king's armor. Yes. And so it was fitted to Saul's person. And now that has to go fit on David and it doesn't fit him. You know, it's uncomfortable. It's too big. It's kind of loose. He's never tried it before. He gives him his sword. David's probably never used a sword before in his life. And he's like, I can't use this. And Saul's like, you need to take it because if you don't go out in it, you're going to be killed. And David says, no, I don't want to go with this. I'm not taking it with me anywhere. And he literally says, it says that he in verse 39, it says that he has said to go for he has not proved it. He said, I don't want to take this. I'm sorry. I cannot go anywhere with this armor. And so he said, what am I going to do? I'm just going to take my sling and some stones and my stick and go. And everybody else, they said, what is he doing? Right. But this is when the story flips on its head. I read a book last year by... A brilliant mind. His name is Malcolm Gladwell. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He's written books like Outliers and you know the 10,000 Hour Rule and Talking to Strangers. Very very smart guy. This guy he's a he's of Jewish uh, descent, so he's grown up, of course, with a lot of these stories. And he wrote a very interesting book called David and Goliath. And he takes this story and he gives it from a from a very interesting point of view. And it was that point of view that I'd never seen before that kind of just said, oh, wow, the, hello, this is a new way of looking at this story. Okay. Here's what he did. He said, what people don't realize is that in the days of ancient warfare, it was an infantry-based warfare. You had people with their swords and their spears going up against other people with their swords and with their spears, right? Right. And whoever had the strongest arm with the sword usually won. Whoever had the fastest arm with their spear usually won. And so however far you could thrust your spear, however hard you could swing your sword would determine whether or not you were a champion in any particular battle. What is David's weapon here? David's weapon is a sling. It's an artillery instrument. Right. He's not even entering the battle as a simple infantry foot soldier. He has with him a weapon that is superior to swords and spears because he can hit somebody from range. He doesn't even have to get near to the swords or to the spears because he can stand at a distance and pick his enemies off one by one. And in fact, in ancient Israel, you see there's a story in the book of Judges about the civil war that is fought between the 11 tribes of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. They have this, um, this elite force of people called the Benjamites, and there's 800 of them who were excellent at using slings. 
and they could hit a target standing over a hundred meters away. It says that they could sling a stone at someone standing a hundred meters away and hit a single hair on their heads and not miss. Wow. In fact, they have actually done archaeological studies in Israel where they have dug up birds with shattered skulls from being hit by a sling. They could actually, the most skilled people with the sling could hit a bird in flight. That's amazing. This wasn't just a child's toy that David was carrying around. It was a pretty stunning weapon with which he had killed a bear and a lion before without even having to come close to them, standing at a distance and hitting them with it. And in the Valley of Elah, and I know this because I've had, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to actually go to the Valley of Elah. Wow. The stones there are of a higher density than the stones in other places. They're very, very powerful rocks. And so what David had was a huge advantage over Goliath when you actually look at it in these terms. It's not even a fair fight because Goliath is this massive target that David will most likely not miss. Because if he has been trained to hit a bird in flight, and if he's been trained to hit a lion or a bear running away, how much more easily can he hit this large stationary nine and a half foot target? If you look at it from that way, David has a huge advantage over Goliath. Never thought of that. Very interesting thought. But nobody else saw that except for David. Everyone said, no, this guy is a man of war from his youth. This guy is so powerful. This guy has, you know, has a really big sword and a big spear, and he is the best swordsman and the best spearsman that's you know, alive at this particular time. And anyone who goes up against him is going to be defeated. Of course. But get this. David didn't go at him with a sword or a spear. He went at him with a sling. He completely changed the dynamic of the battle, and that one simple change turned him from being the underdog in the fight to being actually the most powerful person in that battle. Wow. There was a very interesting article written in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago about the game of basketball. If any of you ever watch basketball, it's really kind of cool. There's a lot of big tall people playing and they run and they jump and they shoot and they jump up and they stuff the basketball into the hoop and it's really, really cool. But up until the 1960s, basketball, you would not jump to shoot the ball. You had to stand and shoot. No one ever thought of jumping and shooting. Really? And the thing which is now called the jump shot where you jump over a person and shoot the ball into the hoop, that was invented by a guy named Dick Forsbury. And this guy was short. He was about seven inches shorter than his older brother. And they were playing one day in the backyard, and this guy's older brother kept beating him. Every time he tried to shoot the ball, this guy's so much taller than him, he just swapped the ball down. Because obviously he's got seven inches of height on Dick. And Dick is trying, and he's trying, and he's trying. And finally, Dick comes up with this crazy idea. When his brother puts up his hands, he jumps up in the air. And when he jumps up in the air, now he's taller than his brother. He shoots the ball, and the ball goes in. This move has never, ever been seen before in basketball. And this guy went on to be the best player in his high school. He was the best player in his college. He joined the NBA, which is the, uh, the basketball league of the U.S., the most famous basketball league in the world, and won them a few titles. And sure enough, everyone started doing it because this one guy took his disadvantage and changed up the game in a way that he became the best person to play it. And everyone else was, could not deal with the fact that this guy was so much better than everyone else because he took his disadvantage and turned it into an advantage for him by changing up the game. Had he tried to play the game by everyone else's rules, he would have been defeated, and very easily. There is a psychological component to this. It's, it's called the theory of compensation, and it was written by a guy named Alfred Adler. And basically what that means is the things that can be considered your greatest disadvantages can actually be your greatest advantages if you find a way to leverage them. Wow. 
And so in this battle with Goliath, David, if he goes with a spear, he's dead 100 times out of 100. If he goes with a sword, he's dead 100 times out of 100. But if he goes with his sling, he's the winner 100 times out of 100. That's interesting. But at this moment, he has to make a choice. Do I put my faith into what I know? Or do I abandon it for something else that seems more likely to bring me victory? Because if you're over there handing out weapons to the soldiers, what are people going to choose? Are they going to choose a spear, a sword, or a sling? 99 people out of 100 would have walked away with the spear and the sword. Yes. But David held on to his sling. And as we know, he came down to Goliath. Goliath laughed at him. They had a little bit of a verbal debate. Goliath charged him. David put the stone in the sling, smacked him in the only place of his body where he didn't have armor, smack in his forehead. And he hit him so hard that it says the stone sank into his forehead. And Goliath collapsed. In one shot, David shattered Goliath's skull and won the battle with one single shot. Now, where am I going with this? When I read that, it brought a kind of like a realization out in me. Because we as Christians, as people who know and love the Lord, we're in a carnal world. The Bible says that we are in the world, but not of the world. But God still wants us to do his work in this world. And so a lot of people think that in order to be successful in the calling that God has for them, they need to embrace the things of this world. The only problem is, is that the people of this world are so much better at those things than we are. In fact, there's a parable that Jesus tells where, and he says that, I think it's in Luke, when he talks about the children of darkness versus the children of light, and he says the children of darkness are so much better at certain things because they're always working, whereas the children of light work seldomly. We're never going to match up in worldly things to the other people around us. If we go out into the world to do God's work, trying to beat evil at its own game, we are going to lose a hundred times out of hundred. That's right. So what do we need to do? We need to change the game. We need to enter in with the element of God's spirit the element of God's favor, the element of the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And it is that Holy Spirit of God that creates change and works out God's will on this earth. That is our advantage. And going forth with the Spirit, going forth with that anointing, that is what changes the game and makes us victors 10 times out of 10, 100 times out of 100, 1,000 times out of 1,000. And you can see this played out in the lives of the disciples. No matter how hard they tried, they were always ignorant. They were always gullible. They were always, you know, making mistakes, putting their feet in their mouth, doing whatever it was. As soon as they had the power of the Holy Spirit operating through them, and they went out in the power of that spirit, they began to change the world because nothing could overcome them and nothing could hold them back. It's true. And so that is the element that we as believing Christians have, the Spirit of God, which enables us to do His work here in this world. But it takes faith to believe that and it takes faith to act upon that and to not let everything go because we see that, okay, maybe we, maybe we can't really compete in this field with these other people, or maybe we should try doing these different things. Maybe not. Maybe the Lord wants you to operate by his spirit, in his power, and in his anointing. Remember that famous verse from the Bible, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In the book of 1 John, it says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. 
And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It takes faith to believe it and act on it. But with the spirit of God within us, we can change this world. But that all depends upon our perspective. We have to see that the things that God has given us, the spirit that he placed within us, that is what changes this world. We have to look at the anointing of the Holy Spirit as the thing that creates change and makes a difference in this world. As Paul says in the book of of Corinthians, he says that we look not at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. We need to embrace that. And as David did, put faith and confidence in God and in the spirit that he has given us to accomplish his will here on this earth. Because when that happens, then we can go forth and win the battle for him. Then we can go out and change the world. And you know what happens when we do that? Verse 58, and we'll close with this. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. This is the coolest thing. David comes back from the battle, covered in blood, carrying the head of Goliath, and he comes before Saul. And remember, Saul had hired him before. He was working in Saul's court before. And Saul had just spoken to him a couple of hours before that, before he went out and made his challenge. Saul sees him, and Saul says, Who are you? Not because he didn't know who he was, but because he didn't recognize him. Because in Saul's mind, David the shepherd, all he could do was play his harp. That was all David the shepherd was good for. But David the shepherd with the spirit of God is now a deliverer of God's people from their mortal enemies. And Saul says, who are you? He can't even recognize him because what he expected him to do and what he was able to do with God's spirit are cosmically apart. Look at the apostles. They were unlearned and ignorant men. What does it say in the book of Acts? It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they knew that they were unlearned and ignorant men. But then they marveled and they understood that they had been with Jesus. Wow. People might look at you and put you in a box and say, this is all you're good for. This is, you're from this small little village. You're from this little place. You don't have much of an education. You don't have all the tools to be able to succeed. You know, this is all you're good for. With the spirit of God, it changes that. God's spirit, if you yield your life to his spirit and follow the calling that he has for you and you walk in the anointing that he's placed upon your life, the results will be unrecognizable. And the same people who thought that you couldn't accomplish anything will one day look at you and say, who are you? How did you do that? And that's where the answer from the Bible comes in, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. But you need to have faith in that and you need to keep that perspective. So don't lay aside the favor of God. Don't lay aside your confidence in the spirit of God. As Paul says, cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. God will reward your faith in his spirit if you hold on to it. And that, for me, I think, is one of the greatest lessons of the story of David and Goliath. Nightlight. You're listening to an international edition of Nightlight, shining God's love light to the world. And thank you so much, David Karan. And you'll be hearing a lot more from David on upcoming Nightlight podcasts. Please check out David's Patreon channel, Dive Deep with Dave. You'll find the link below. Until next time, this is Chris Glynn signing off and looking forward to being back with you again very soon for another international edition of Nightlight. 
God bless.